Our next speaker, Inigo Ortega, Ortega, graduated from the ETSI Bilbao UPV UHU, EHU in Spain with an MS degree in telecommunications engineering in 2008. He was a research assistant in the computer science department of the Colorado School of Mines and then a research associate with Technalia Research and Innovation in Spain. He's currently a PhD candidate in the Department of Electri Electrical and Computer Engineering at Stony Brook University and is supervised by Professor Peter Jurek. He's specialized in statistical signal processing and machine learning and is interested in the science of data inference, modeling, and prediction. So good afternoon, everyone. First, I would like to thank my advisor, Professor Juric, for nominating me for uh, the Provost Lecture Series, and of course, the committee for accepting my candidacy. Thanks, all of you, for coming today to the talk entitled In Search of the Dynamics of time varying Phenomena. So in the data of information sensing devices, research methods to extract information from the data that we observe is critical and it's becoming very, very relevant. I'm sure you're familiar with terms like machine learning, data science, big data, etc. Today, I would like to focus on one specific line of work, which is the processing of time-varying phenomena that is observed sequentially in time. So this kind of problem is critical in many applications, both in, in science and engineering. From the, in the community that I, came, I come from, speech processing is a classical example of time-varying phenomena, and actually this type of problems is going through a revival due to Google Voice, Apple Siri, Google Cortana, and others like that. Within the economics departments, they have lo been looking at how good prices evolve over time, and they try to predict where the prices might go tomorrow, and for example, in the financial market, they try to analyze the stocks and predict what the stock might be tomorrow to uh, earn money or bet more money in, in this, or be able to learn money to people, etc., etc. But in other more scientific fields, this time-varying phenomena is also applicable. For example, now that we're worried about global warming, we need to study precipitation, temperatures, uh, pollutants in the atmosphere, etc., to be able to assess whether this climate change is happening or not. Even doctors, who are not always biggest fans of computers, are often uh, left looking at signals like neuro neurological signals, electrocardiograms, etc. As a matter of fact, I show here on the, on the right side uh, a fetal heart rate where a doctor has to realize that there is an anomaly at the end of the, of the fetal heart rate and has to call a cesarean section on the mother. So these applications are critical and in all of them, the goal is to try to find what is the underlying scientific truth. So this problem poses several challenges. One is that we need to process this data as it comes. We cannot wait half an hour until we have all the data and then process it, because by, by the time, the fetus might be dead. So we have to pro process this as we go. Another problem is that the data that we observe is not exactly what we're interested in. For example, here, I show how the signal that a doctor might observe is full of errors, noise, etc., etc. So we need to figure out how to extract the underlying dynamics and patterns that we're interested in. And furthermore, we also want to try to predict what's going to happen tomorrow or in the next minute. So these are the challenges that we're interested in. And today, I would like to go through an overview of the methods that we've been working to try to infer and predict this time-varying phenomena. So our work is based on three bedrocks. The first one is a mathematical formulation known as a state space. And it is very simple. We're going to use a formula to describe what we observe, and I'll refer to that as y with underscript t because it evolves over time, which is a function of the underlying dynamics that we're interested in, which is xt, and is shown in, in red. So for the rest of the presentation, whenever you see red graphs, that's the underlying dynamics that we're interested in, and the blue is going to be what we actually observe. 
So with this mathematical formulation, we can cover many different scenarios. We can cover the noisy and erroneous scenario that I showed before as seen here, but we can also accommodate very, very challenging examples where the data that we observe is very different from the actual underlying dynamics. The second foundation of our work is Bayesian theory. Thomas Bay was a Presbyterian minister but in today's talk, I'm more interested on his work in inverse probability problems than in his work in theology. So let me explain with an example what inverse probability problem is. Let's say that I have a box with three white balls and five uh, black ones. If I ask you what is the probability of me drawing a white one, this can be uh, solved quite easily, I hope. <laughs> but if I ask you the following question, having the same box, I pick one of the balls and I hide it here and you don't see the color. Now, I let you pick one and you see that it's white. Now my question is, what is the probability that the ball that I kept here is white? So that's an inverse problem because we're interested in some event that we did not see based on what events that we actually did see. So the solution to this is the Bayes theorem, which is mathematically written like that. I don't want to go into the details, but it basically combines what our prior belief or our prior information is about the, the events with the observational evidence that we are actually able to see. And this will be critical for the uh, job in hand. The third foundation is a computational tool. The problem with Bayes theory is that deriving those probabilities is not always simple, and we need approximations to it. In our case, we'll resort to Monte Carlo methods. Monte Carlo methods are a class of computational algorithms that approximate functions of interest by randomly sample, sampling some candidates. And let me show you with, again with a picture what I mean. So we're interested in approximating this red curve, but this is very challenging for whatever reason. So what Monte Carlo methods suggest is, why don't you randomly pick a set of candidate points and then I will tell you what the weight or the uh, value that you have to put into that particular candidate so that you approximate the function of interest with high accuracy. Of course, the numbers of particles or the number of candidates that we use is going to be relevant. So all in all, the work we've been doing is get the knowledge you have about the uh, phenomena that you're observing, try to give some mathematical form to it, in the state space formulation, and then use Bayes theory so that sequentially, meaning that we process this as we get more and more data, we can provide estimates of the underlying dynamics and also try to predict the future. So let me give you a little bit more detail on this. So first thing we have to do is know what the phenomena we're interested in, use the driving forces, and determine some function g that depends on the past of the dynamics, some parameters theta, and because we're uncertain about actually what is going on, some innovation process UT. For example, with a formulation like this, we can model very different types of time-varying phenomena. We can model short memory properties, like the one shown on the left, where the data changes from one day to the other very quickly. But we can also model data that evolves very slowly over time, because they have long memory properties. So the parameters here would be A, B, P, Q, and the details of uh, the innovations UT, but I don't want to go into details. I just want to show that with such an example, we can, with, with such an example formula, we can describe very generic uh, phenomena. In some other scenarios, we might want to have more than one variable of interest. And in this case, we also want to know if they are dependent or correlated. For example, in this, we, by using this formulation, we can show that we can have in a scenario where where one of the variables, x1t, has, when, whenever this one has high values, the other one would also have high, high values, for example, or vice versa. So with such a flexible formulation, we can cover another very big set of problems of interest. As I said before, we're never going to observe this dynamics, so we again need to determine how we acquire this information in reality. This is usually, this function h usually relates to how we acquire the data in, in practice. And that's why we, this will depend on the hidden dynamics xt, some parameters, and some observation noise vt. 
For example, coming back to the example I showed you before, we would have a formulation of this form, where we have the underlying dynamics plus some noise and er errors. In some other, other scenarios, we might observe a time evolving signal and we might want to distinguish what is the trend, x1, t, so you see that this trend is pretty much the trend of, of the signal, but we also want to see how much this signal changes over the trend. So a function like that will help us do that. Once we have defined what the problem is, then we are left in hands of Bayes, and we'll use that to determine the probability of our hidden dynamics given the data that we observe up to this point. So I want to emphasize here that we are not providing just one value of what we think the true value is. We are the, uh, providing a whole probability density, meaning that we are saying the probability of each of these possible values is this much, all right? And this, for example, is very helpful when we predict. Why? Because now we can not only say, I believe tomorrow's weather is gonna be 25 Celsius. I can tell you, for example, that I am 100% sure that it will be bigger than 20 Celsius. So this might be helpful, for example, for a doctor to know that, don't worry, this FHR doesn't, I'm 100% sure that this FHR is not gonna drop below certain fetal heart rate. So this probability information is very, very helpful in many applications. However, as I said before, we are in most of the practical problems of interest, we're not going to be able to determine this function exactly. So we have to resort to some approximation. And this approximation work as follows. We propose a set of candidates. We think, all right, seems that the data will move towards this area on the space. And then given the new observation, we'll weight these candidates and, that, and have an approximation to the actual probability density. I don't want to bother you with the details. I'll keep that for the fun of my committee members. So I'll just show you how this works in a very uh, challenging example. So on the lower uh, left corner, I'll show you some data that we are collecting, again in blue, because that's what we observe. observe. And in the top left, I will show in red what the actual dynamics are, and in green, what the estimate of our method is. On the right side, I will show you the details of those approximation to the probability densities that I was mentioning, and you'll see how they evolve over time. So let me go now to... So again, this is, uh, it's a video because I want to emphasize that this is done as we get more and more data. So this is down here the data that we're observing. The red is the actual underlying dynamics and the green line is what our method is estimating. On the right side, you see at every time instant, what is the approximation to the density that I was referring to? And you see that most of the time, the red line, which is the actual value, is covered by our, our approximation. On the lower right, I'm showing again the same density and in dark, in, 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 yeah, in, in dark uh, blue, we, I show the true value, and the black one is our estimated one. And you see that they are usually quite close. So again, I want to emphasize that this is a very challenging scenario because of two things. One, the signal looks very differently from what the actual dynamics are. And the other thing is that, let me go back to the presentation. The other thing is that we don't know any of the parameters A, B, P, Q, or the variance of the driving noise UT. So this is a very challenging example, and still our method is able to, we believe, track with quite a lot of accuracy. However, some of you may ask, okay, Nigo, but you need to know the form of this, and who's gonna tell you that in, in, in practice? So this is what we've been working for the last months, and the idea is that what if I am not sure about the underlying model? What if I don't know what is driving this noise? And without going again into too much detail, the idea is to fuse the information that different experts or different models are providing us, combine them together in a smart way. I buy, and by a smart way, I mean that we're going to weight them 
depending on their performance in previous data. So let me show you this in another example. Let's say that we're going to observe again down here some data that is the true underlying uh, dynamic plus some noise and errors. But we're not sure about what the actual model is, right? So I'm gonna illustrate this with an example. Let's say that you go to a class, first day, you get the syllabus, you have, um, you have your professor say that you're gonna be handing assignments every week. You realize this class is gonna be very tough. So you meet with a couple of ha classmates and you decide to work together. So you have two models, two candidates, two of your classmates. Then you go home, talk to your roommate, and your roommate says, oh yeah, I took that class a couple of years ago. You are like, yeah, I'm gonna use his input to three models. And then you talk to your mom and your mom is, oh yeah, I, I, I know a little bit about that. I will help you too. So now you have four models, right? So at the beginning, for the first assignment, you're gonna consider all of them equally. And again, I will show you a video. And the idea is that over time, So the idea is that we're going to combine over time their opinions. You'll see the weight that each of these models or candidates has over time. And on this plot, the other two are the same. Here's the observed data, dynamics of interest, and what the actual estimate is. So you start, or we start running this, and if you see there, yeah, more or less they are all equally equal. But you realize a couple of weeks that mom's input is not really helping, helping you. I'm sorry, mom. But so then you are left with the three other models. A little bit farther down the road, you realize that your roommate, yeah, he was very kind, but he completely forgot about what this class was about. So he, his, his model is also completely being ignored. So you're left with the two classmates who actually know about this, who can actually explain the data. They know about this. And as the semester goes on, you realize that there is actually one of the models which is the one that actually knows the data, who is giving you the best results. So that's why you are giving his input more and more weight. So you see that at the end, once that we have given the true model, because the red one is actually the true model that created the data, but that we didn't know beforehand, once we give to that model the most of the weight, our accuracy at the end is really, really good. So I hope that with this, example, I have convinced you that the methods that we are working are very flexible and can be applied to very challenging scenarios. Because we try to assume as few things as possible about the, uh, the underlying truth. But our methods are still able to extract information from the observed data and also provide informative predictions. So thank you very much for listening and I'll be glad to hear any questions you have.